Good morning. morning. Happy Father's Day this morning to all of you fathers out in the congregation. It's a a nice day of getting recognized for all of your hard work in raising these wonderful children that are around us and those that you've already raised and that are grown. I I was awakened to a wonderful, delicious breakfast in bed of a a Nature Valley bar (laughs) that... um, Quickly, as they do, just disintegrated all into my bed, so now I have some, some uh, housekeeping to do as well. <laughs> and it was wonderful. Thank you, guys. And a glass of milk as well. So. Um, good morning, and it's good to be with all of you. Guests, we'd like to get to know who you are if you're here with us for the first time. Um, we have red books on each pew and ask that you pass those down and everybody pass them down and put your, put your name there. And if you're a guest with us, please leave a way to get in touch with you uh, so that we can do that this week and get to know you a little bit better. There are some announcements in the bulletin, not too many, but uh, VBS is coming up at the end of July. And that's an important time in the life of our congregation. We need sort of all hands on deck to make that um, go smoothly and to introduce some children here in our midst and in our community to the love of Jesus. So please come be a part of that. It's a privilege to be a part of something so special as that. Uh, Right after uh, worship service today, we have a business meeting. So members, please stick around and we will take care of some business um, as as quickly as we can. Um, And today, I believe the youth, it's today, the youth are leaving uh, to go on a mission trip um, to south of Richmond, Chesterfield area along the um, Route 1 corridor. So please, we need to keep them in our prayers. Uh, be praying this week for them. Uh, maybe each, each day, just pray that they would be safe and that God would use them in big ways and that they would return um, different than they left. Let's now enter into worship together. May we know the presence of the Holy Spirit here with us today. May we be open to your leading, sensitive to you speaking, and alert to your calling. Father, we invite the same power that was at work when Jesus was raised from the grave to be present with us here now. Lord, we declare that you are welcome here amongst us. In Jesus' name. Yeah. 
Let us pray together. Gracious Lord, we thank you for the gift of your promises, that you will be with us, that whether we rise on the wings of the dawn or fall to the darkness of the sea, you are there. Your right hand will hold us fast. You will give us grace and life everlasting that begins when we open the door to your son who knocks, asking for us to let him in so that he might come in and dine with us and Make us a new creation. Would you give us all that hunger and thirst for that relationship that quenches more than all the cool rivers we can imagine? Lord, today we pray for our youth who are going out to offer that cup of cold water and your life-giving water to the people south of Richmond who need your love and your grace upon their lives. Would you keep them safe? Would you give them hearts to serve you and to serve others? And may they, as well as those they serve, be transformed this week. Heavenly Father, from you we learn what a father and a parent is. Strong and loving and wise. For your sake we honor those men who have helped us who have helped give us life, and all the men who, whose love and strength have helped us to grow. Thank you for the men who held and played with us and helped us learn what your joyous love is like. Thank you for the trustworthy men who taught us about your faithfulness. Thank you for the men who challenged us to make something of ourselves. Men who wouldn't let us stop with crawling when they knew we could run. Thank you for the men who taught us to play fair and the men who encouraged us to give our very best. Thank you for the men who worked hard and sacrificed much so that we could have it better than they did. Thank you for the men who showed us that gentleness is the proof of real strength. Lord, we ask that you be with those fathers who must live apart from their children and with fathers or mothers who must raise their children alone. Enable each to foster lasting, life-giving relationships with their children. Grant us now, Lord, to worship you in spirit and truth as we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three in one. Amen.
to all the fathers that are here today, the ones that are have children, have grandchildren, maybe some that will have some children soon. Uh, we just need to take the time to appreciate our parents each and every day, not just a single day during the year. So will you please join me in prayer? We give you these gifts today knowing that you are the father of gifts, ever faithful God. We long to be faithful givers modeling ourselves on you who have given everything to us may your spirit of abundance which gives more than we ask or imagine grace these gifts for your kingdom you constantly provide for us caring for us as we have been abundantly provided for so we give abundantly to the work that you give us to do the work of the church, the care for others. Accept these gifts in Jesus' name. Amen.
you please be seated and when our children come forward for the children's seat. Good morning. Good to see you this morning. There you go. You know, this is really special. The last time I was with you, it was, anybody remember? Mother's Day. <laughs> and now look, now what day is it? Father's Day. How special is that? We can be together both of those wonderful days. Well, I know. I know you have lots of special things planned for your dads today, and I've heard Pastor Allen's already had this wonderful special breakfast, I know there's lots more going on for him today, but uh, you know, those things are pleasing and happy, make our dads happy, and they do so many things for us. But you know, just one second. We also have our Heavenly Father that we need to think about, and what are some things that we could do for him that would be pleasing and make him happy? Can you think of some things? Love. Anything else? Not being a devil. Be kind. Yeah, that's right. being kind. You ready? You got it. Um, boys and girls, when we do those things like being kind and show love, that, that that's pleasing to him, and we follow his commandments and make good choices, I need you to do something for me right now. I want you to take a real deep breath in. Breathe in. Now breathe out, real slowly, and do it one more time. Breathe in, breathe out. Oh, what a peace and a calm that helps us feel. I want you to think about that, and I want that to remind you that we have a peace when we have God with us. He's always with us, he's always in control, and he's there in the good times with us, and he's there in the hard times with us. So we can have that peace and we don't have to worry. So boys and girls, today too, we can say Happy Father's Day to God by doing kind and loving things. And we can also help by making good choices. So let's close with a prayer. Dear God, thank you for these boys and girls. Thank you for loving us and help us to love others. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Children's Church. Carolyn, it's brave work sticking a microphone in front of the children. We're going to be reading from the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. And in your pew Bibles, it's on page 980. Book of Romans, chapter 5. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in our hope of sharing the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit which has been given us. When I was in high school, I was introduced by a friend at church to the band Boston. They were popular in the 70s and 80s, and they were famous for their soaring high vocals and their dual lead guitars, and I loved to, to sing those songs in the highest falsetto I could muster, and I learned to play some of those timeless guitar riffs on those, those instantly recognizable lines. Now, this morning I thought about getting out my electric guitar to demonstrate some of that. Um, but I know a couple of church members that might roll over in their grave. So I'm, I'm going to stick with the acoustic today. And um, 
I'm going to settle for just playing a couple of lines for you from one of their songs. I understand about indecision, but I don't care if I get behind people living in competition. All I want is to have my peace of mind. That's all you get. You may or may not recognize that song as a 1976 hit, Peace of Mind. I understand about indecision, but I don't care if I get behind. People living in competition, all I want is to have some peace of mind. It's a great song, it's, it's a great band, but there's a really good story behind the song and behind the band. The founder of the band, the lead guitarist, was a guy named Tom Schultz, an MIT grad, who was working as a senior engineer for Polaroid. And on the side, he was putting this band together, and he was plugging away at his day job. Schultz noticed that a lot of people around him were, as the song says, climbing to the top of the company ladder, but, but they didn't realize that they had propped that ladder up against the wrong building. They were counting on predictability in, in the corporate life. And what Schultz wanted was he wanted more. He wanted peace of mind. And so his song with the, the vocals and the guitars, it soars with hope and it, it urges you to, to take a look ahead, as it says, to something better. He started the band. He, founded, he found his, his peace of mind and in something other than the corporate ladder. And now more than 40 years later, people still resonate with the idea behind Schultz's lyrics, looking for some peace of mind of their own in, in a world where things might seem hopeless to people, where suffering happens. What does it look like to find that peace of mind? It's a struggle to find it, and I, I think part of the problem is that we know that things are supposed to be different. We know that the world isn't the way it should be, and we know that we aren't the way we should be. If we look at the biblical understanding of, of peace of mind or, or of peace, we find that it comes from things like standing on the promises of God and nothing else. The promises of the one who can, who can do something about the things that keep us from peace. And some of those things that keep us from peace are the sufferings that, that Paul talks about. One of those things that we often just can't get our heads around is this idea of rejoicing in our sufferings. What does Paul mean by that? Why would someone rejoice in their sufferings? He talks about the progression that, that suffering leads to endurance, which leads to character, which leads to hope. But... But does any one of us really rejoice in sufferings? Why does he say that? Well, I think, I think it has a little bit to do with what was going on with the Christians there in Rome during that time. Historians from that period, as well as, as the book of Acts in chapter 18, it talks about how Emperor Claudius expelled all the Jews from Rome, made them leave. It, it's very very likely that the Christians that Paul was writing to in Rome were caught up in that same expulsion, made to leave the area. You know, that as far as Roman government was concerned, Christians were basically Jews to them. They prayed to this, this one God instead of the pantheon of the Roman gods. Christians and, and, and Jews, they were different. And so Claudius expelled the Jews, probably some Christians too, and what came with that, as you can imagine, was some serious suffering. People being ripped from their homes and made to leave the country, it, it was terrible. The Hebrew people were not new to this idea. If you'll remember the exile that had happened and they'd been all sent to Babylon and so forth, it, it was suffering. What I think is interesting is how Paul Paul's claim that we should rejoice in suffering goes against 
the traditional teaching of the time, of, of what we would call Deuteronomic law. That's, that's a big word you might recognize from the name of the book Deuteronomy. It was a traditional Jewish theology and thought, and it was taught that if something bad was happening to you, that you did something to deserve it. In other words, if you're suffering, you must have done something to make God mad. The other religions have this idea as well. You've probably heard of karma. What goes around comes around. And we see it in the Gospels sometimes as well. When, when the disciples say to Jesus in John chapter 9, for example, Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? That was the prevailing thought of the time. It was the teaching of their faith. And so it shouldn't surprise us that this is what the disciples were thinking about that man. And perhaps even what Christians might have been thinking in Rome. What did we do wrong to deserve this? Have you ever thought that? What did I do to deserve this? Is God punishing me for something? Why is this happening to me? I believe if you look through Scripture, the New Testament, Christian theology, I believe that it teaches that this isn't the case. That when a tree falls on your house, or when you're in a car accident, or when a flood ruins your home, it's not necessarily God teaching you a lesson. If you look at our text to say, to today, it says that we rejoice in our sufferings. It is impossible to hold a Deuteronomistic worldview of that, that Deuter Deuteronomistic law. It's not possible to hold that worldview and say these words that Paul is saying. Because if you think that way, in, the, in that law way, you would say that suffering is a result of God punishing you for things you did wrong. But here, Paul says that there might be something good to come of suffering. That we should rejoice in our sufferings. And so, Paul has developed his theology, Christian theology, to the place where we can realize that even though bad things happen, there might be some kind of hope. Or peace. That God can bring good things despite the bad things. When the great Chicago fire of 1871 consumed the city, Horatio G. Spafford was an attorney and he had lots of real estate investments. And so he lost a fortune in that fire. Also, around that time, his only son, who was four years old, died of scarlet fever. He dealt with his grief by pouring, pouring himself into work, helping people to rebuild the city, and helping to those 100,000 people who were now homeless because of that fire. Spafford was a, a devout man of faith, and so in 1873, he decided to take his wife and daughters and go to Europe to one of the revivals, or to some of the revivals of D.L. Moody and Ira Sankey, and then and then go on a vacation in Europe. But he got caught up had, and he needed to deal with something urgent at home. So he sent on his, his four daughters and his wife ahead in a luxurious French ship, promising to see them soon. Then one night in November, as the ship was in the middle of the ocean, it collided with an, another iron ship. And it tilted up in the air, the passengers hanging on to whatever they could find, and within a matter of 12 minutes, the ship was sunk, along with all of Spafford's daughters. But his wife was found unconscious, clinging to a piece of wreckage. When she and the other survivors landed in Wales, she cabled her husband, saved alone. They had lost all of their daughters in the wreck. Spafford immediately traveled to meet his wife across the Atlantic, then on a, a cold December night, the captain pulled him aside and said, I believe we are now passing the place where the Villa de Havre, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it in French, where the ship went down. 
Spafford went back to his cabin, finding it hard to sleep. And he wrote these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow is like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, the Lord shall descend, even so it is well with my soul. Writing these very words as he passed over the watery resting place of his family. It's truly standing on the promises of God. That though trials should come, that he had a blessed assurance. That when sorrows like a sea billows roll, that is well with my soul. And standing on the promise of Christ coming again. That third verse, the day when the faith shall be sight. When things so terrible as what Horatio Spafford went through. He had the blessed assurance of the promises of God. Because even though these bad things happened, that Christ regarded him in his helpless estate. Because even though he now sees through a glass dimly, as Paul would say, one day his faith would be sight. That even though we don't know why bad things happen, we can stand on God's promises. Promises like all things work together for the good of those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. That even though bad things happen, God can bring good out of them. He doesn't cause the bad things to happen. He isn't punishing you for something bad that you did. Paul rejects that theology here in Romans 5, and he says that we can rest knowing that God is with us during the storm, that he can take something bad and make it beautiful afterwards, and that we can grow in spite of the suffering. Do you struggle to have peace of mind? Do you struggle with all of the sufferings of this world, the sufferings of your life? I know it, it seems hard to get to the place where you would take Paul's advice here to rejoice in the midst of those sufferings. But I believe we can rejoice. Rejoice knowing that God wins. It's not being happy that you have suffering. It's rejoicing knowing that as believers in Christ, we know, we know the end of the story. That there will be a new heaven and a new earth. That God will be with us and that we will be his people and he will be our God. We won't need the light of sun to light our way. There will be no more night, no suffering, no mourning, no sickness or pain. But Spafford says it well when he wrote the words. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. Let's pray. Father, we admit that it's hard to read passages like this sometimes. Thinking that maybe we're not Christian enough or good enough to understand what it means to rejoice through suffering. But Lord, we're reminded that it means to rest in the promises of your word. 
that you are with us. To rest in the hope and peace of mind it brings to know that you are sovereign and that you will win the day. And so, Lord, give us that peace and hope that comes through believing and living as your children. For it's in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, we pray. Amen. We believe that God is always moving in our lives, moving in the world around us, calling us to take notice of what he's doing. We're invited into that life of recognizing God at work around us. And perhaps this morning you recognize God at work in your life. Recognizing that perhaps even through your sufferings that he's there. Even despite of your sufferings, something new can come. And maybe for the first time you would say, Lord, I'm, I need you in my life. I do have suffering, and, and I do have sin in my life, and I need you because you are the rock of our salvation, and you bring good out of bad. Whatever decision you have to make, make it now as we stand and sing our hymn of invitation.
please again be in prayer for our youth as they travel this week to be on the mission field. And also, uh, members, please stay afterwards for a business meeting as we take care of some things together. But now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you all, both now and forevermore.